Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. Today, I am honored to have Carlo Valdez with us, and uh, you're going to get to hear a fascinating story. Um, you know, I think if you asked him to write his story, I don't know if he got a thousand endings that he would ever pick the one that he's at right now, but uh, there are a lot of uh, ties in there. And I think something that has stuck out to me about Carlo is he is extremely hardworking. And when he puts his mind to something, he's going to accomplish that. And uh, you're going you're to hear that highlighted today. So, Carlo, I want to start by highlighting uh, when you were a youngster, you had mentioned that, you know, one of your dad's friends in, you know, some rotary or, you know, some group had said, hey, maybe your sh son should, uh, you know, check out a track team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where'd you dig that up? That's actually funny. Um, I didn't realize I was out there or that <laughs> maybe it was. But but anyway, yeah, uh, that that all started when I was like six. Yeah. I was like six years old and yeah our, our we used to have like these city meets um uh man what, what was it called i think it was like smaf or something uh, i forgot what it stood for southern california or something i don't know but anyway yeah i uh i don't know one of my one of my best friends at the time was like running and he ran that same track meet uh, in newport beach um and what i did was the the either like the 50 meter or the 55 meter in the 100 um and you know it was the guy i don't know they thought you know i'd do well and you know i ended up winning that race and qualifying for the next step um and stuff like that i mean i don't know how it ended up that year but that's how like the whole track thing started how mm -hmm. i got an organized track and uh and yeah like set, set a record for my age group i think i still have i still have like three records no um across like different age groups um for for that meet and yeah. and if you even even won a few like overall like southern california titles through that but yeah i did i did that meet like up until i was in junior high i believe okay so and it was it was a weird it was a weird meet because they don't allow you to wear spikes you can only wear like distance running shoes or waffles yeah um but yeah, that, that's 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 a long time ago. But that's that's how like my time in track started. Really, I just yeah. started went to that meet and just kind of you know bloomed from there. Got got organized or got into organized teams like AAU, Irvine Cougars, yeah. uh, Irvine Lightspeed, um, and even ran unattached um, over the years. But but yeah, you know that's how that's how I just it all started. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and so you talk about how, you know, growing up loving athletics, right? You know, um, track was not the only thing you did. You also played football, but you had mentioned that the love of your life was basketball at that time. And so talk about how you, you know, developed the, all the different sports and, you know, playing multiple sports in California, right? It's not like you were in some small, tiny town. I mean, you're playing at a, at a large level. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was doing NJB stuff at the time also. Um, yeah, and I like basketball. You know, I, I, I like the Jazz. I was a Jazz fan. I liked Carl Malone and John Stockton. You know, even when they're getting beat by the Bulls that time in the finals, <laughs> still a fan. I, I go to Lake. I go to uh, you know the Great Western Forum when the, they were playing the Lakers, and you know just have all my Jazz stuff on. Um, this was before I was a Lakers fan, and then once once Kobe came in the picture, and I was you know became a Lakers fan, Kobe yes. fan stuff like like instantly when he was a rookie. Um, but yeah, and, and I want to do basketball because I wasn't playing football yet. You know, once I start playing football, then I'm like, all right, well, football is the thing. So I started playing at like seven, very young, tackle yeah. football at Journal American. Um, so yeah, that that's you know that, that was that's literally the start of, of all that because before even before that, I was doing like soccer and swimming and gymnastics. I was I wasn't doing a bunch of things just to like create athletic awareness. I don't know if my parents knew what they were doing at the time, but they put me in anything. So yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that, that's, you know, being in, like you said, being in an area where it's pretty, uh, you know, competition's pretty high. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I didn't know any better at the time. I was just, we we're just keeping it fun back then. So yeah. yeah, I didn't really think about that stuff. I love it. Now, as you progress into high school, uh, you really start showing a lot of promise. I mean, you set, uh, what high, high school record for discus. Uh, mm -hmm. you're obviously excelling on the football field. 
and talk a little bit about that, you know, um, having some success there and the confidence that that gave you as you started pursuing and evaluating, you know, the next level and uh, looking at collegiate athletics. Yeah. So I knew in high school, I, I, I knew I had to, um, like just narrow it down and just focus on one or two things. So I was focusing on football and track at the time. Um, wanted to play f- football in, in college level and, you know, be successful, start, you know, make a huge impact. Um, and I was on track for that. And, you know, I, I had scholarship offers actually to uh, Arizona State and Washington State. Uh, but those fell through um, Washington state fell through because of coaching change. Like the whole administration got fired essentially. And then at Arizona state, the coach that I wanted to be with ended up leaving uh, to go to the NFL. Yep. So, so then, you know, my, my last, my backup schools for that were, you know, UCLA and Oregon and I'd have to walk on there. Um, so I ended up, you know, choosing UCLA while keeping track as another option as well. Cause you know, I, I love track. I was doing it. Kept me, kept me functional, kept me yeah. fast. Yeah. Um, you know, not knowing what it would lead to, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I was, was pretty an all around athlete. You know, I, uh, you know, sprinted 100, 200 to the four by one and also through discus. Yeah. So set, set the school record at that time. Um, so I, I really, if I was going to do track, it would be, I thought I was going to be more of a decathlete. Yeah. Um, which I ended up doing my first year. So, uh, at UCLA. Yes. And, and yeah, once, once, you know, high school happened, yeah, a lot of good things happened, a lot of records, you know, successful high school career, if you want to call it that at modern day. And, uh, yeah, it just set me up for, for UCLA and, you know, I ended up playing football for that first year, uh, as a red shirt, yeah. just doing scout team stuff. And, uh, and then, from there, I also did track, and I knew after that first year, okay, I'm like, this is too much. I have to decide what I want to do, and that's why I said, you know, I'm going to focus on tracks. That's where I think my best opportunity is going to be for right now, and I love both, but, you know, you know, I love track more at that time, so um, not knowing, you know, I, I was, when, when you're young, you don't really think about the big picture, right? You just think about the now, um, so, you know, knowing what I know now, I might have stuck with football, but then again, it w- I wouldn't have evolved to bobsled. Right. So, you know, you got you to look at it different ways. <laughs> Absolutely. So just talk a little bit about that, um, you know, with having a love for football, also having a love for track, right? I mean, anytime you're good enough to go division one in both, you're clearly enjoying and good at that. But talk a little bit about that eventual decision to say, all right, football, I'm done. And I'm going to move to track because that, that's not an easy thing, right? I mean, people struggle with that all. I mean, you see pros yeah. retire, right? And they struggle with that. So, I mean, talk a little bit about that as, you know, 19 year old making that big of a, you know, life choice there. It was tough. Yeah. It, was, it was a really tough decision. Um, like I, I remember the whole thing. I remember like saying this is what I'm going to do, telling people like, you know, my parents, one of my coaches back home, one of my mentors, um, and then walking into uh, Rick Newhouse's office, that was his right after his first year coaching um, at UCLA. And I just remember just breaking down and, you know, yeah, yeah tears coming out, you know, my eyes and stuff. And it was just, it was just tough. I didn't realize how tough it was going to be because I was just closing the, the, the book on, uh, man, like 12 years of football. Really. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, since I was seven all the way up through, I was, you know, 19. So, so it was just tough for me. It was tough for me to, to accept that, you know, but ultimately I did and yeah. just ran with it. Cause I knew, okay, once I make the decision, I can't go back and change anything. Cause you know, that's just not the person I am. You know, I, right. I once I fully commit to something, I'm going to commit to it. Um, so yeah, committed a track, did the Catholic that first year. Um, you know, I was really happy where I was going. So I was learning new events and things were going well. And then ultimately just because I had the thrower sprinter combo. Yeah. My coach at the time, Mark Benegas wanted me just to stick with javelin. Yep. And then, and then he then ended up coming back and then another coach came in who was a, a you know, throws coach also, but more specifically, you know, was handled more javelin throwers and hammer throwers. And he said the same thing. He's like, Hey, art was right you know, I'm going to make you a javelin thrower. So I ended up throwing javelin for 
the rest of my four years I was there. And yeah. uh, that's when I got bigger. You know, I got a little faster too, um, you know, because it's the strength aspect of it, you know, getting all that muscle. And I went from like 190 to like 220. Um, so it was crazy how yeah. it all evolved into that. And, uh, but yeah, I was fully committed to whatever I, you know, I did and decided. Yes. And so to your point, your track and field experience progresses, right? You, you didn't end up doing what you started with, but there, there's a, uh, probably a first planting of a seed. I think it was maybe your sophomore or junior year. One of your track coaches is there and is recommending that, Hey, two guys should try this bobsled thing. And he says, Hey, when, when you graduate, maybe you should try this bobsled thing as well. Now at yeah. that moment, I mean, was that like a, okay, in one year, out the other year, and later on you came back to it? Or was that something that you actively started to, you know, read about or learn about or, you know, ask questions on? Uh, yeah, it, it was just one of those things that was just kind of out of the blue. Yeah. Uh, where he told, you know, Andreas and Nick, um, hey, I think you guys would be great at this. You need to be strong and fast. That's really it. So just do a combine, see what happens. So Andreas was graduating, so it made sense for him just to try it. And then Nick was a grad assistant and, you know, needed something to do in the offseason, I guess. So yeah. so he tried it out as well, and they both made the team. And that's when he's like, all right, well, if, if they can make it, then you can make it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it kind of got, you know, pushed to the side because I was still in only a third year at that time. And... You know, I was following closely what Andreas and Nick were doing. And, you know, they were competing on the World Cup tour, you know, doing well, getting some good results. Um, you know, they were they're also getting ready for the 2018 Winter Olympics or not 2018, but 2014 in Sochi. And and then that was when I graduated. I graduated um, 2013. And that was like directly a year out from the Sochi Games. And, you know, I, I knew it was going to be tough. I just, I just didn't realize that I didn't really have a chance because they rely a lot of it on experience. Right. So I, I, I was training for it, did a combine and stuff like that after I was done, but just didn't do enough, not nearly enough to even, you know, be on a radar, but I did enough to get my foot in the door for the next year, yeah. um, for the next quad after everything was done. So, so it was good. It was good that I did that. And, you know, I got, I had to, you know, heal my body a little bit because I was pretty banged up from javelin. Javelin is not something that it's not a natural sport, not a natural, uh, right. motion that you're doing. So I had a lot of things wrong with me. You know, I had Achilles tendinosis, I had elbow tendinitis, I, you know, shoulder was messed up. Uh, I had separated ribs, um, subluxations, if you want to call it that. And yeah, I just needed time to, to recover because it was brutal. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it all worked out. You know, I, you know, after the Sochi games went back, started training, I trained a full year for it, another combine. And then, uh, yeah, now, you know, seven years later, here I am. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, so let, let's not just breeze over this. So you use the term yeah. combine. Okay. So combine is a, uh, is a rigorous, testing right and you're kind of showing off your athletic ability but it's also very competitive in regards to the number of people that are trying out so talk a little bit about that that competitive nature and you know what it takes to actually be relevant showing up on the radar at a combine yeah so combine or these combines are more just a test of potential and athleticism just like okay is this guy is he an athlete you know would he would he fit and so that's just like the first step of many. Right. So a lot of, a lot of people think the combine is everything, which it's not. Yeah. Um, it just gets you an invitation to rookie camp. Yep. And from there, well, first of all, the combine, it's, it's similar to other combines like the NFL combine, but we do 45 meter sprint. And then we get points based upon the full 45 or at the time for me, it was 60, but now it's 45. Okay. Um, first 15 meters, then the 30 meter, then the 45 and then the flying 30 that's, we get points and times for all those. Yeah. Then we do a standing broad jump. Um, 
And then we do a underhand shot toss with a 16 pound shot. Um, and then we do a one rep max clean and a three rep max squat. The max being 150 kilos in the clean and 200 kilos in the squat, which, you know, for, for me now, that's like nothing. Um, for, for a lot of guys now, it's nothing. Yeah. But when you first do it, it's like, all right, I haven't hit these numbers yet. Maybe I can hit these. So it's right. a good test. Yeah. Um, and you, you, depending on how many points you get, that's how you get invited to the comp or to the rookie camp. You go through rookie camp. You get familiarized how to push a sled technical wise, you know, just getting that feeling. You have a little rookie push championships right after that, after a week, and just see how fast someone can pick it up. Yeah. Um, and then after that, you get invited to national push champs with all the veterans, Olympic athletes, stuff like that. Um, you know, did well in, in both, did well enough, I should say. Yeah. Cause I was still figuring it all out. Right. And yeah. And then from there, I, I was actually dealing with a broken toe my first year. I don't like, I broke it after the rookie push championships and there was only three weeks between then and the national push championships. So I was like in a boot for like two weeks and somehow was able to, you know, run. No, I couldn't run hundred percent. It was, it just felt weird because I couldn't like push off my toe, Yeah, but, but yeah, I just worked with it, you know, yeah. showed, showed some, some grittiness you know with the coaches yeah and and then from there team trials happens and team trials is like a inner squad of you know teams yep. or inner squad between multiple teams within you know the usabs um you know men's and women's teams so you, pilots pick their own team so i was i got picked you know with the usa5 pilot the fifth best team according from the your, your prior results yeah. and then we ended up doing really well. I mean, we, we ended up like pushing like, I think top three times. And then we got like fourth in it. And I was at a two and four man. And then I did enough there to get named to the national team my first year rookie yeah. um, as an alternate. Yeah. So I, I was an alternate at that time. And, and that's how I made that first national team, just going through all those steps, you know, a lot of, a lot of boxes to check off, but you can't overlook any of those, especially when you're newer, you got to like really, really show that you're someone that can grow and develop in the sport. Yeah. So two things that you mentioned there, and I'll start with the last one that you said, and then we'll go back a little bit, but you said the pilot picks the team. So it's yeah. not even just like, all right, Hey, here's your physical test. If you meet these criteria, now you're good. Right. It's like, no, the, the pilot is actually going to say, you know what, Carl, like I, I, you're good, but like, I might like that guy a little bit more and he's equally as good. So I'm just going to, I'm going to pick him. So talk a little bit about that side of things. I mean, because clearly, yep. I mean, even with coaches, there's a political game, but even more so when it's sure. not a coach, it's a person that's, I mean, it's like having the quarterback pick the team or the point guard pick the team. Right. And saying, and eh, we don't need the coach there. Yeah. Well, that's only during uh, team trials. So, yeah. it, but either way, it's still very subjective. Yeah. Um, with the selection uh, or the criteria to make the team. There's so many things that go into it, like, especially the national team, like pilot inputs, a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you likable? Are you a good teammate? Like, yeah, we get it. You're an athlete. You're good. But <laughs> like, like, can't, can you, you know, put your ego to the side and, you know, be more for the team than yourself. Yeah. That, that's a big, big aspect. Huge. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, over the years, we've really grown, uh, you know, a great culture where, you know, we have everyone here is a great teammate. Yeah. You know, where before it might may not have been that way, but we've developed that culture to the point where, OK, we don't have any bad eggs. Yeah. You know, we, we everyone here is on the same page. Everyone here wants to work for the same thing. We're all working not just to get to the Olympics, but the standard is to win, you know, medals, yep. gold medal. You know, that's 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 the ultimate goal. Yeah. So, so when you're, when you're around people with the same goal and the same attitude and that same mindset, it raises everyone's level even more mm. yes. because they, just, they want to be, they want to get there. They want to get to that level. So if someone does something good or great that day, they're like, oh, I'm going to do that too. And the next thing you know, it's like, there's a huge energy that day. Um, and it's just, it's just contagious. 
you know, nice. it motivates everyone and it raises their level. So, so yeah, very, yeah, very subjective uh, selection criteria, but at the same time, at the end of the day, you know, I would say most of the time, the right people get picked to the team. Most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. Now, something else that you had said earlier is that it's a very technical sport, which makes a hundred percent sense, right? I mean, small margin for error. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, you know, things as a new bobsledder, right. That you were having to learn that were the technical things, but it makes all the difference in the world in regards to gold medal versus, you know, not even meddling. Yeah. I mean, the sport comes down to a hundredth of a second, yeah. you know, hundredths of a second. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they start going by the thousands, right. you know, honestly, L- Luge does, um, because we, some, some ties happen and it's just like, okay, we need to separate it even more. And this is after going down multiple heats and miles of ice. And it still comes down to the wire like that, which is crazy. So, yeah. I mean, what, what goes into it, like technically, I mean, pushing wise, I mean, there, there, there's some cues that optimize you know your ability to push a sled fast like to start hitting right angles stuff like that like we, like you would see of a sprinter coming out of a track block yeah very similar but we're using our whole body to right. you know make sure the sled's moving because if you're just using your legs and not your upper body then you know that's that's so much left out right um so yeah not just the push and the start and actually having the running techniques or the running uh biomechanics to to optimize everything, but also you need so many reps to, uh, r- when you're running down the ramp, you're hitting over speed and then you're, you're starting a load. The pilot is starting his load and then we have to load based upon what he's doing. And it has to be so synchronized to the point where we hop in, we need to make sure that we're maximizing our velocity. Right. Cause, cause you can have a fast start, but if the velocity gets messed up at any point, then we lose speed. And if you don't have speed at the top of the track, then it's going to compound at the bottom. Yeah. So it, it's just huge. Um, those, those precious hundreds just go away and we need to make sure that we do a ton of reps, just loading and synchronizing ourselves, you know, just one by one by one by one. It's like ballet on ice, you know? Yeah. Um, and you see that on TV, you're like, man, these guys are like well-tuned. Right. right. Um, and yeah, it's just, we, we've done it so many times and we don't have to think about it anymore that it's just, it's just natural for us. Um, and, it, and it looks, and it looks good, you know, yeah. after a while, especially when you've been with, with a specific team for a while too, you just, you just know what someone's going to do. Right. Um, yeah. so so that, I mean, that's just like the first five, six seconds right there. And right. Then, right. I was going to say, that's just the first five, six seconds, man. Yeah. But it's huge. Cause you can win and lose right there. Easily. Bingo. Um, and then after that, you know, we get, we get in position to where we're in an aerodynamic profile, um, trying to create as the least amount of drag as possible. And then from there, it's up to the pilot. The pilot mm-hmm. has, you know, he's got everything in his hands. You know, he has got the D rings. He's the one that's been, you know, doing all the runs, obviously has all the experience on these tracks and the more experience, the better, of course. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm not a pilot, but, you know, they, they do a lot of mine runs, you know, when they can't go on the track, cause you're limited with the amount of runs you can have on a track. Um, you just can't go every, every day for, you know, six, eight, nine times, whatever, 10 right. times. It's just, it's too hard on your body. Yeah. Um, so we have to maximize the amount of reps we get each day, which is like two to three. Mm. That's it. Wow. Um, and, and then from there, it's just, you know, it's, it's all about confidence with the pilots. So if they know it and they, they know they're going to nail it, it usually ends up that way. Yeah. Um, but down the track, you know, they gotta be clean. They gotta know when to enter, when to exit, you know, how to go through a turn with, without, um, you know, steering too much. Cause the less you steer, the faster you're going to go. You're creating less friction that way. Right. And when you're doing more steering, you're creating more friction with the runners on the ice. Yep. And it's taking time off. So yeah, it, it's, you know, there's so much that goes into it. Yeah. Um, on top of that equipment, you know, type of runners, type of sleds, stuff like that. But, you know, ultimately 
you know, the, the push and the drive is the biggest thing. And the, in the, the way we ride in sled too, the aerodynamics yeah. of the crew. So, so once you get lot. off on the push, what was your role after getting in? Just, just staying low. And, and again, we, we practice, we practice how we should be riding the sled a lot by doing dry loads. Yeah. So like loading in the sled and getting in a position where we know we're in that spot that we need to be. So like, you know, you got your pilot up here, two guy right there, three guy, and then four guy. Yep. So, you know, wind just passes over us. Yeah. Head, head and shoulders, you know, that's where we need to really pay attention to. So that's great. So yeah, just, you know, again, amount of reps and the feel that we get and then looking on film and saying, okay, is this correct? Do we need to change anything? And yeah. then from there, yeah, we did, that's how we make those adjustments. So that's great. So yeah. you, you mentioned the mental side of it, right? You said the mental runs, the mental runs. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what the coaching of that is like for you guys. And, you know, I mean, sports psychology, however you want to talk about it, has become so much more prevalent over the last, I mean, decade even um, than what it was before. But talk a lot of, or talk a little bit about, you know, the mental side and some of the, I guess, either mentalities that you work on or just the visualization techniques that you guys use. Uh, for the pilots, you know, that's, that's, I wouldn't know, but I just have an idea, but for, for me, yeah. um, uh, like I know the track just based upon me going down it and I see it cause we have, there's, you know, POV videos that you can look at and you can do track walks too. Like you can go down the track before practice, whatever, yeah. and just get a good idea of, you know, where everything's at and what it's going to feel like. Um, and that's what I do. I once my head's down because I don't see anything. <laughs> um, the brakemen don't. And and yeah, I'm just I'm just like there and okay, I'm like, all right, one's one's a right, two's a right, three's a left, and then long straight away, or you know, whatever. I have all that stuff in my head because I have to know the track. Cause if we don't, then you know, if you go into a turn at a high speed and, and are not prepared for it then there's going to be some whiplash. Right. And then when there's whiplash, you're creating top heavy force. And then the pilot might feel that and might have to make an adjustment based on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, we, we do our best. We don't lean in the turns. We just, I just, we just tilt our heads slightly, like, you know, slight turn just to make sure that, you know, we don't get, you know, a just hit the side of the cowling high side <laughs> or the side of the sled. Right. Um, and like sink a little bit too that helps um because you want the force or all the weight at the, at the bottom of the sled so you try to like you know simulate that yeah um so yeah i i you know i i can tell you like every single turn and what it would feel like of every track in the world that yeah. i've been to at least because there's a lot of tracks i haven't been to but right right um but yeah so that i mean that's important for us as brakemen to to visualize that and then as far as like you know getting ready for the push and stuff mentally preparing for that. I mean, it's just like, all right, again, we've done it a thousand times. Yeah. I don't have to think about it. All I gotta do is like take a lot of caffeine and just go out of my mind. Yeah. Put, and then, you know, just hit the, hit the bar as hard as I can and just run. Yep. And then next thing you know, you're in the sled. So, yeah, I, I think so, that's so, I think it's so interesting, right? I mean, you, you practice so long, not, not even just like the number of reps, but I mean, the amount of time, all of that, and the actual event is only, you know, seconds, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's a very small amount of time, but it, I mean, that's such a transferable idea thought for whether it's business, right? I mean, you, you should be practicing for these things time and time again. So that way, when you're in the moment, you, you can excel at that moment because you put in the prep, you know, preparation prior to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's just, you, you practice, you, you make it a real thing. Like, you know, it's live, you know, it's, it's a real rep. And then, yeah, once you get into the real thing, you know, you should know what to do, but obviously there, there's that other element of like, all right, this is live. There's people, there's people watching you're on TV. <laughs> you got, you got the atmosphere, but I, I thrive off the atmosphere. Yeah. Which is why last year sucked because we had no fans, right? nothing like that. No hype. We just had the TV cameras and the lights, which is still, mm -hmm. you know, that's at least we had that, but right. you know, I've, I'm the most type of guy that feeds off the energy of the crowd. Yeah. And, and the bigger the crowd, the better, the better, the louder it is, the better. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those guys. And a lot of people are like that too. So, so that's good that we're finally coming out of this, you know, 
of this all COVID stuff and, you know, having fans back at the games and stuff. And for us, you know, it'll, it'll be like that too, but, um, but yeah, the same thing in business, you know, yeah. I've, I've been in finance for three years. Yeah. Um, you know, have my, have my own financial planning practice and it's just like, you, you need, you need the reps, you need the reps in order to excel at, you know, actually adding value whenever you're face to face with someone. Mm-hmm. But then again, of course, you're going to make mistakes. Mistakes happen in yep. everything. No one's perfect. You know, and, and if you make a mistake, guess what? You just, you just keep going, just keep going. Like, you know, do it, do it hundred percent. Fall that's on your awesome. face, just get, just get up. Um, and, and yeah, that's how you get better. You, you just, you just got to keep doing it and have the confidence that you're going to get better at it. And next thing you know, you don't have to think about it. You're just already there. Um, and you know, yeah, it goes for, it goes for everything, you know? Yes. So, yeah. That's awesome. So it's interesting that you talk about, you know, the hundreds of a second to, you know, thousands of a second. Uh, I had Sean Pete on here and I don't know if you heard of Sean or no Sean, but uh, he runs uh, Chip Ganassi's race car crew. And uh, he talks about the very similar thing. Uh, You know, he talks about how we give people, you know, one second to get five, you know, bolts off of a tire and be able to change a tire. And he goes, Mm -hmm. well, 0.2 0.2 seconds doesn't seem like a lot of time to anyone, especially not in a 500 lap NASCAR race. But when it comes down to the very end, 0.2 seconds is the difference between first and fourth place, right? And so that yeah. one bolt on a tire, it does matter. That's why we spend so much time practicing it. So to your point, you know, hey, that takeoff, you know, yeah, it seems like, well, it was only a half a second in the beginning, but that half a second in the beginning is the make or break between a medal and not even placing right yeah yeah exactly and i and i've seen like pit crews like actually practice and i didn't realize how big it was until like we got to tour penske's you yeah. know facility in mooresville north carolina um so so yeah same same thing you know it, it's just it comes down to such a blink of an eye you know i don't know if you ever did uh or ever like play around with like the little timer on your phone and try to click it as fast as you can. Yeah. Like if, if you do that with like one finger, it's like a 10. Right. So the fact that it comes down to one, one hundredth, <laughs> like you kidding? Like this, the, everything, everything matters. Everything. Yep. Exactly. That's good. So in the bobsled world, there's obviously the winter Olympics and the Olympics that we get to do, but then there's also mm-hmm. the world cup. So talk a little yeah. bit about competing, you know, at those different levels um and you know what the world cup looks like in regards to competition and this season if you will yeah so world cup happens every year um that's like our season essentially and you know we go to the same tracks every year sometimes we'll add in like maybe some that we don't go to every now and then but everything's pretty much the same seven races and you know we travel you know it's it's once every week you know one week here one week there uh so we're, we're traveling a lot yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, if in the year of, uh, non-Olympic games, we have world championships, that's our, you know, s- start of our postseason, if you want to call it that. Right. And then, and then we'll have that. And then when we come back home, we'll have national championships, um, which is like for seeding for the next year or for, for buys, you know, yeah. onto the national team. So still important. Yeah. And it just gives everyone the opportunity to race on an even level because not everyone can go on World Cup. Some people go on different circuits or some yeah. people are developing. So it's just a good way to showcase, you know, everyone in in our, you know, in the USABS community. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 how we give everyone a chance. Um, and so, then from and then Olympic year, of course, yeah. that's you know, there's the Olympics and several yeah. championships. So with that then and this is me just not knowing um, if I'm you and I'm qualifying for the Olympic team, does that unit of guys compete on the world cup tour together or are there multiple teams and you might be with some of the same guys, but some of, you know, maybe alternates or different guys. Yeah. So, so it depends. So uh, the Olympic team is not named until a month prior to the Olympics. So they won't get named until January. Dang. Yeah. yeah 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 fun stuff yeah they want um, you competing until the very end yeah and that's like the same way with some sports too right um but but yeah i mean ideally you'd want to be with the team 
most of the year that you're going to go with to the Olympics. But, you know, if they want to see, you know, what the best combo is, who the best guys are, you know, we'll have two sleds on World Cup tour this year. So, you know, it's six brakemen, two pilots, and two alternates. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wish we had three, but, you know, we'll have a third sled trying to get a shot on the lower circuits because that can still happen, by the way. Got it. They can still earn enough points. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I mean, it, the combos aren't really necessarily up to us. I mean, we, we can influence it in a way if it's, well, the way to influence is by getting results. So yeah, right. we gotta get results. <laughs> um, and if you're pushing fast together, then that's a good sign. Um, but if things aren't clicking then yeah, they're going to switch things up. Yeah. But what we do to prepare for that is we, you know, we make sure we're pushing together in these different combos you know, all summer, all yeah. fall leading up to that to make sure that, okay, if this combo were to happen, we're prepared. Like right. we, we know each other, we, we, we've done it. We might need a few reps to get on the same page again, like for practice, but ultimately like, you know, it should, it should work out, but it, again, it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally you'd want to have a team set for the whole year, all the way through world championships or the Olympics. But you know, for us, it's just, it's, it's a little, it's a little more difficult. Um, but you know, we'll, you know, at the same time, we'll see, you know, there's a lot of potential combos that can happen this year. Um, you know, prior to the last little bit year, we, we even like kind of were interchanging a few guys to a new, okay, this might happen. This might happen. And then when it did, we were ready. We we're yep. still pushing fast. So that's what we have to do. We just, yeah. just got to get reps in now so that we're not surprised later. Yep. So I would love to hear the recalling of your first opportunity when you found out you're going to get to represent the United States. I want to, I want to talk about the actual Olympics because I know that was a, just a monumental moment, but that when you found out that you're going to get to represent the United States. Yeah. Um, when they made a decision, you know, it really didn't hit me at that moment. Yeah. Um, like, it was just like, okay, like, it's time, really. Yeah, like, yeah. it's time to get this, you know, cranking and, you know, show up and, and blow up, you know. But um, then when it did hit me, it, it hit me when I walked out of the tunnel yeah. um, for the opening ceremonies. Yep. That's that's when it hits you. That's when it hits you for, for a lot of people, really. And it's like, all right, well, this is crazy. I'm here. Right. Like, I mean, yeah, right. Um, Cause you got all the cameras in your face. You got all these people dancing everywhere. You got everyone in the stands. You, you know, it's just big energy. Yeah. <laughs> big, big energy. And you're just like, all right, nah, this is sweet. Um, one of my ultimate goals finally achieved. And right. the last one would be winning a medal. So, so yeah, I mean, everything you, you put in all the hard work over the years, you know, from a kid to, to now all the different sports coaches and, you know, support, like that's when it hits you. You're just like, all right, this is, this is why I did it. Right. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's, that'd be the best way to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now with that, you know, obviously you had a lot of support from college coaches, right? Because I mean, they're the people that kind of introduced the idea to you, but did everyone support this? Were some people like, Carlo, what are you doing? I mean, like, do you, are you sure you shouldn't just go get a job? You know, like, I mean, are we really pursuing a bobsled dream? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are just like, what are you doing? Yeah. They thought, they thought it was cool. Yeah, right. But again, they, they didn't, they didn't like, I would say most of them are just like, the hell is he doing? You know, <laughs> right. Which is, which is fine. You know, I, yep. you know, I, I just, you know, thought to myself, I'm like, all right, this is like literally my last go round of yeah. trying to, you know, make something work and trying to find something that works with my athletic ability. Yeah. Didn't even know it was going to be pushing sleds, but it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and yeah. And then, you know, the, the cool part was, is that like the support behind me was huge. Mm um like you know there are a lot of people that were like reaching out and following me on you know on social media because i want that's why i have social media is to keep people up to date um 
Yeah, I, I have fun with it too, but it's mainly to keep, like let people know what I'm doing because I'm, I'm right. here in the middle of nowhere in the Adirondacks in Lake Placid in New York. So, you know, I don't get to see a lot of people, you know, I only get to see people when I'm home and that's mm-hmm. a short period of time. Right. And luckily I got to catch up with a lot of people the last two years when I took that time off. But, you know, before that, it was just like, you know, blinders, the blinders were on big time, you know, they're, they're on now that I'm here and, you know, you know, you don't like distractions, but, you know, for me, I, I like, you know, social media is a good distraction for me because, you know, again, it, it helps people know what I'm doing and, and there's a huge support system with comments and messages and, you know, see, things like that, people reaching out and, you know, it, it's cool to see how much I've gotten over the years and how many, how many people and, you know, that group still growing to this day. Yeah. Um, of people that want to know what's going on yep. and, you know, want to be their support. So, um, but yeah, when I first started, yeah, totally people are just like, what are you doing? But now it's like seven years later, they're yeah. like, oh, that's, this is sweet. I can't believe you're still doing it. Right. It's the same, same thing with, with finance. Like people are like, what are you doing? And now three years later, they're like, all right, you're serious about it. So, yep. um, cause it, cause it's, that's, it's not an easy thing to, to do. So you bet. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So for you post competing, do you ever see yourself wanting to do coaching or is that something that coaching in the bobsled realm, not even something that would you know be intriguing to you? No, no, I'm not going to coach bobsled. <laughs> no, as much as I love the community and I love everyone that's been involved here in the town and, you know, just, you usopc in general usabs like i i just you know i can't stay here yep. i gotta start a life which luckily i have and um continue with that yep. so but hell i'm gonna help out any way i can when i'm done you know whether it's you know su- like supporting or um reaching out to other athletes who are in the sport now or recruiting stuff like that yeah i'm still gonna like definitely do that i love it well it is absolutely fascinating to see where you've come from to where you're at today uh nothing but you know best wishes for you as you continue to train and then uh, get to represent the united states again but uh no man it was great to connect with you and i appreciate you uh sharing your story today yeah yeah, thanks, Phil. I appreciate you having me on. And yeah, it's always fun talking about this stuff, you know, it's because a lot, again, not a lot of people have, they have zero clue of what we do. So the more people know, the more exposure we get, it's just going to, you know, add more insight uh, for them and more excitement for people who are watching the Olympics, not just summer, but for winter too. So, yes. Yeah.